today is, is Thanksgiving. And as I had mentioned already a number of times, there are an awful lot of things to be thankful for. And today I'd like to bring you a story. And the story that I'm about to tell you, upon hearing it, might cause you to think, well, what has this got to do with Thanksgiving? So, at the end, you're going to see. Our story takes place in the land of ancient Israel. And after Solomon's time as king, um, when the kingdom had been divided, it happened while King Ahab, son of Omri, was king over Israel. Ahab ruled the northern kingdom of Israel in Samaria, out of Samaria for 22 years. And if you read the Bible and you read the story about King Ahab, you'll realize that he was not a good king. As a matter of fact, he and his wicked wife Jezebel did more to inflame the anger and displeasure of God than any of the other kings of Israel before him. During his time, he, along with Jezebel, promoted the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth. And the land was polluted and filled with wickedness, and the people were led astray. As the case is, whenever there was wickedness in his people's camp, God sent his messengers to speak his word and to warn them to repent and to turn from their wicked ways. And God spoke the nation of Israel through his chosen prophet Elijah, who advised wicked King Ahab that the judgment of the Lord would come upon the land. There would be a great drought and there would be no rain on the land until spoken by the Lord through his servant. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. Our text this morning is 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 16, where we'll read about this story. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The jar of 
flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Wow, quite a story, isn't it? Well, when we look deeply into this story, this morning I... I believe that we can take several things to heart from it. And we can learn a number of important lessons from what's been written about how God deals with his children. Now the nation of God's people, the the people whom he had chosen to be ambassadors of his message to the rest of the nations of the world, they had fallen away from the worship of God and were led astray from worshiping the Lord to worshiping gods of the Canaanites, Baal Asherah. Elijah, who was connected to God and stood up and spoke truth against the king of his day as God had directed him, was not a very popular man in the king's court. I'm sure that he was telling Ahab and the other people of Israel to turn from their idolatry and that um, if they did not, God's blessing and God's protection would not be upon their land. Now, because Ahab, or because Elijah, rather, was working under the instructions of the Lord of heaven, he was completely protected from the wrath of Ahab. Ahab, I'm sure, when he... Elijah did this, and there's other stories in the scripture where Elijah did stuff, right? Was wanting him dead, wanted him out of their hair. Jezebel hated Elijah. She wanted him taken care of. And God knew that when he gave this message to Ahab that he would not be a very popular person. So what did he do? He gave him instructions to go into a wilderness area near this brook on the other side of the Jordan River in the desert mountains. And there, God would protect him. You see, when God's servants are in the midst of a mission that he has given them to tell the people that they have been commissioned to tell the truth of what he has to say, the Lord protects them. Now, we as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ do not hold the office of Elijah the prophet, but God's principles of protecting his children are the same. When we come to accept the sacrifice of Jesus as our Savior, as Christians, we're spiritually reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through our Savior. As Christians, um, God's hand rests upon us. And his message has been given to us and is inside of our hearts because know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ who raised Christ from the dead lives in you and gives life to your mortal body so that you are not your own. You are bought with a price. The mission that you have in this world is not for you and for the people around you alone. It is for the others that God would bring into your life. The others that surround you. We can be thankful that we are born again in the Spirit. Jesus has paid the price for our sins, forgiven us of our sins, cleansed us from our iniquities, and he's placed his Holy Spirit within us. We are alive in the Spirit. And we, as a result of the Spirit bringing life to us, have become the children of God. Not born in the flesh as children of God, but born in the Spirit as the children of God. And as a child of God, the Word of God throughout the Bible tells us that the Lord takes care 
of his own. He takes care of his children. Now, there may be times in life where we need to stand up for what's right. God commissions us and sends us to share his word with other people. Faith comes by hearing, and when we speak the word of God, people's hearts are affected by what we say. When you speak the word that God has given through the Bible to those that are outside of your sphere or outside of your uh, family, outside of your small group, and you start to share the Lord with people, that's where the gospel goes forward and faith comes by hearing the word of God through God's people, through his children. God's word instructs us to step up and to trust him and to have faith in him and to speak the truth despite critical or opposing voices who may not like to hear what we have to say. In recent events unfolding in the world, we see that it is more clear than ever that the world needs the church to step up to the plate. They need our words of hope. They need our words of warning. They need to hear the truth of the gospel through the people of God. There are times when we should be silent and listen and learn. But there are also times when we need to speak the truth with wisdom and with love and the power of the Spirit that God gives us. There is an instruction for every believer to do the work of an evangelist. That means that every believer is commissioned by God to be salt and light in the various places that God plants you in the nation that he's given you to live in. That includes us. What are you getting at, Pastor Quinn? When we speak the word of God, the message will sometimes be received with gladness and we'll see people come to know the Lord. We'll see people open up. We'll see people begin to open up. But many times when we speak the truth of the word of God, we're not always going to be received with gladness, particularly when we live in a wicked generation where people love their darkness rather than the light, we are sometimes going to get re, re, rebuked and sometimes will be in danger. But God knows this. You see, He knew this with Elijah. He never withdrew the mission because it was going to be hard. He, withdrew the, he didn't withdraw. He, he asked Elijah to withdraw from the circumstance to protect him and to give him his sustenance that he needed. And there are times when God asks us to back off and go to the wilderness or whatever. It can be meaning a number of different things. But not to be afraid because the Lord is taking care of us. If there is an Ahab or a Jezebel that wants to have our head on a platter, we don't have to be afraid. God will direct us. He'll tell us where we need to go to be safe. So do not fear. In Isaiah 41.10 it says this, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise in the word of God to his children. You are a child of God. That is a promise to you, to all who place their faith in the Lord God Jehovah and have come to know him. The Bible informs us about the protection of God as humans. We want to see God's protection as kind of a magic force field that keeps us from all kind, experiencing all kinds of displeasuring, uh, un uncomfortable you know, harm from the, from the onset. Elijah didn't have it easy. God protected him in the way that he saw fit. Eventually, Elijah was sawn in two, I think. No, no, sorry, he went up into heaven. It was another prophet that was sawn in two. Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. But the, the thing is, he, he, had, um, he had things happen to him. And many times God works in a way that we do not understand. Sometimes God's protection comes in the form of peace and strength in the middle of the difficulties we're facing. Other times his protection comes as an ending because he sees something more on the horizon 
that we cannot see. Have you ever had God transfer you out of a, a, a place, a position, because there was something that was going down and he protected you from something? I've had that happen to me. Maybe you have too. Where all of a sudden you find yourself transferred out of a department because the conditions there are volatile and you've been praying, Lord, help me. Either change hearts or get me out. And he, and he gets you out. Okay. As a believer in Jesus, okay, we are promised a new life under the protection of God in which nothing can separate us from his love. Rest in this. No matter what hardship you have to face in your life, no matter what, God is your provider and he's your protector. And these Bible verses about protection will help you focus on knowing there's a bigger plan in that God has chosen you for greater things. Psalm 46.1, for instance, says, God is our refuge and our strength, David says this, an ever-present help in time of trouble. Have you experienced that? I have. As his children, we will experience this. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. Psalm 34.19, the righteous person may have many troubles. Listen to that. The righteous person may have many troubles. It doesn't say that you're going to not have troubles. But the Lord delivers him from them all. How he delivers them is unique and up to his sovereign purpose. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, was delivered from all of his troubles by being ushered to the very presence of God, as were all the other apostles in the end, except for John. So it's not saying you're not going to go through hardship, and you're not. It might even be that your, your, your life ends in this body, and that it's time for you to go home. Elijah, as I was saying before, went up in a whirlwind. That was his, you know, him and Enoch. They were the only ones that never experienced death, but were ushered into the presence of God in their present state alive. Psalm 5, 11. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them sing, ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may, may rejoice in you. God sheltered Elijah from Ahab by taking him to the wilderness brook. And, and the Lord supplied Elijah's need by sending ravens to him with bread and meat. Well, what do you know about ravens? I asked, I asked my wife this morning what she thought when the first thing... I, I, what comes to mind when you think about ravens? What's that? They're bullies. Yeah, they're bullies. They're selfish. They're not known to be generous birds, are they? Okay, all one has to do is come across a flock of ravens over a carcass, right? You watch them fighting over the scraps and, ah, ah, you know, they're jumping in and grabbing and pulling it away from each other and, you know, scrapping over it. Yet, here we see God spoke the word and used the normally selfish scavenging birds to bring food for his servant. It doesn't make sense, does it? It, it, does, it makes sense in that the ravens are going to have their claws into all kinds of stuff. But God spoke the word and their normally selfish behavior became generous. <laughs> when we are in trouble, when we are in need of sustenance, when we are in need of assistance from the Lord, and we cry out to him and say, Lord, help us. He provides sometimes in unusual ways. And sometimes when he provides in an unusual way, it doesn't even make sense in the natural order of things. But the fact of the matter is God is sovereign over all. And you are his child, and you do not have to be afraid of the pestilence that comes at the rest of the world, because God's going to take care of you. God encouraged Elijah and strengthened him during this time. God was the one who called him to this desolate brook. 
God was the one who cared for him faithfully as he had provided manna for Israel in the wilderness. God provided for Elijah's physical needs and his spiritual needs through unclean birds. God can use any means to help us the way he wants to help us. And I'm sure that through what took place, Elijah came to trust more than ever in the miraculous provision of God. There are lessons to be learned about this story today. In times of trouble when God is pouring out his wrath upon lands because of their wickedness, in this case, a God-ordained drought, the will of God will never lead us where the grace of God cannot care for us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. The will of God for us, for you, will never, ever lead you to where the grace of God cannot care for you. That is something you can take home with you and stand upon. This is the promise of God's word, and it's repeated over and over and over again through the whole Bible. Do not fear, my children, says the Lord, for I am with you. He will supply all of our need according to his riches in glory. Well, as strange as it sounds to be fed twice daily by ravens, Elijah obeyed the word of the Lord and, the Lord, and trusted the Lord to work out all the details. And God did, and he always does. The Lord takes care of us when we walk in obedience to his word. He provides for his children. Now, the, those ravens, they were, the Jewish people saw them as unclean birds and they weren't known as solely kosher-eating scavengers, were they? It's not like they would be picky in the carcasses that they pluck from. Pretty much anything that's dead, they're on it. They're not known to be clean birds, right? Elijah, do you suppose that he learned to be thankful for the provision of God, even though it went against the grain of his, his whole teaching that he grew up with, that ravens would be unclean and anything coming out of their beaks and claws would be unclean. Do, do you suppose Elijah became thankful during this time? I think so. God was trying to tell him something. I can take care of you. And I have determined that you need to understand that I have control over all things in this world including those dirty birds, those ravens. And if I say that they're going to give you clean food, they're going to give you clean food. And you need to trust me. As believers, we too, like Elijah, can trust the Lord to supply both our physical and spiritual needs when we've been hidden away by him in a place to protect us. We can be thankful that he will supply every need in every season of our lives. And we need to thank God this morning that he never abandons us to the wolves. He always takes care of his children. He takes care of you. You may not understand, but during the hardship, you know, I'm sure, you know, Elijah's going, I don't understand this, God, but I trust you. Right? He's away from his home. He's away from comforts. He's in some crevice in a rock where the creek's flowing through and, and he's staying there because God directed him to be there. God's delivery systems in caring for us and keeping us safe are varied and sometimes strange. But he's going to meet all of our needs. Perhaps God wants you to look at that, that old raven squawking on your fence. And think, this is possibly a descendant of one of those ravens <laughs> that fed Elijah in the brook. And that dirty bird on the fence 
is a reminder to us that despite the horrible nature of our circumstances, God can even take something like that and use it to help us in our time of need. He provides. Jesus tells us this in Luke 20, 12, 24. He says, Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And then what did Jesus say? And how much more valuable are you than birds? King David said in Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. So, Elijah's needs were supplied at the brook. But despite the fact that he was taken away and he was hidden in this place, the brook dried up. The brook dried up because of the drought that was on the land. And you see, when God has us in a certain place for a certain season to arrest us, to protect us, or whatever, there comes a time when it's time for us to move on to other things. And God will sometimes permit the spring that is essential to our survival in the desert to dry up. So it wasn't all that, in, uh, it wasn't all that comfortable to be there in the first place. But now, what was even com not comfortable, what was sustaining, has now dried up. I'm certain that Elijah wondered, what's this all about, God? <laughs> What are you up to? But I trust you, Lord. What is it that you are trying to say to me now? When things dry up for us at the springs of life where we're stationed, it might just be God trying to tell us to prepare to move on. And in just the right timing, God gets our attention. And we seek him for direction, and he tells us where we need to go. 16th century German theologian jo Johann Meyer he put it this way. He said this. Ah, it's hard to sit beside a drying brook. It can even be harder to sit beside the drying brook than to face the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He also mentioned some brooks in his 16th century language that we might experience drying up in our lives. The drying brook of popularity ebbing away is we see with John the Baptist, who is faithful to the word of the Lord. The drying brook of health, sinking deeper into a, a creeping paralysis or a slow, consuming disease that's, that's taking our health away. The drying brook of money, slowly dwindling before uh, the demands of sickness or Predators that we have to pay because we have to live, or mortgage payments, or maybe just other people's extravagance and excessive uh, increases in, um, in the cost of living. The drying brook of friendship, which for long has been diminishing and soon threatens to cease. Why does God let these things dry up? Why does he let... These springs dry up where we're stationed. He lets them dry up to teach us not to trust in his gifts, but in himself. He wants to drain us of self. He, just as he drained the apostles of self as they waited 10 days before the day of Pentecost. He wants to loosen our roots. So he moves us to some other sphere of service. And education. He wants to put in a stronger contrast of the, the river of the throne water that comes from his living spirit to the brooks that dry up. The brook that never dries to the dry brook of this world. For Elijah, it happened this way. The brook dwindled until there was no more water flowing in it. And remember, where the brook was drying up was because the whole land was under the judgment of God in drought. And Elijah, all he had to say was the word. 
but he didn't do it because God had not instructed him to do it. He suffered through the dry spell and the drying up of his brook even though he could have spoken the word because God had given, that inst- given him that authority and he didn't do it because God had not told him to. See, Elijah trusted in the Lord. Now, was, this is how it happened with him. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow to supply you there with food. Now, now Zarephath was outside of the kingdom of Israel. It wasn't an Israeli uh, place. It was actually in the land of Sidon. It was very likely that the widow that was there was, was actually a Gentile. Now, it doesn't say, but it's likely because she lived in the Gentile country outside of Israel. And this is before uh, Israel was scattered. Right? So in obedience to God, God, Elijah went to where God told him to go, and there he found this widow gathering sticks. And in perspective, why was Elijah, why did God direct Elijah to see a poor Gentile widow? It would have been much easier to supply Elijah's need for God to have directed him to a prince of Sidon or a a governor of Sidon or a rich landowner of Israel or, or Sidon. Someone likely with a table full of provisions, even in the midst of the trouble, someone that could share from their table with him. But God sent Elijah to a poor, defenseless, helpless widow to supply his needs. She was the one God had directed him to see. So when he found her, he asked her if she would get him a drink of water and some bread. (laughs) The widow, however, we know in the story was in great need herself, right? She responded, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and and to make myself a meal for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. She expected that the meal she was about to fix to be the last for her family. She had no other prospects out there than to die of starvation. You see, because the judgment of drought on the whole land had been, had been brought, even the land surrounding Israel, everybody was affected. The righteous, the unrighteous, the ones who had soft hearts towards God, the ones whose hearts were, were hardened, all of them were affected by the drought. Other righteous people or people with softened hearts were suffering in the land because of God's drought judgment on Ahab. And one of these people was this poor Gentile widow who was not even one of the Israelites. She didn't even know God, the God of Israel. She, uh, God of Israel. she called God Elijah's God. Your God. See, she was a, a Sidonite and was roughly from the same area where Jezebel, the wicked king bride of Ahab, had come from. And yet God looked through that and looked to this poor widow's heart. Sometimes God sends his servants deeper into the territory where Baal is worshipped in order to display his mercy and glory for those whose hearts are ready to abandon that life and to change. Elijah told this poor widow, do not be afraid and despite her fears, he told her that She was to make some food for him using a small amount of the last of her ingredients for him and the rest for her and her son. And he added a promise. He says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. He spoke the word of the Lord to her. When you are in the middle of circumstances that you don't understand, God's word stands and God's word and his promises will will stand the test of anything thrown at them. You can stand sure on the promises in the word of God. If God leads you to a scenario that looks impossible, you can stand and trust in the word of God and you can share that word with other people. That's why it's important for us to know our Bible. That's why it's important for us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can 
You can take the word of God to the bank. There is nothing in the word of God that will not come to pass. Whenever God says something, whenever he puts the stamp on something, it shall be done even as he has said. When you take the word of God into an impossible circumstance and you share it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She told, he, he told this widow this, and she went away and did as Elijah had told her, it says in verse 15, so that there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jar of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The widow's faith in what Elijah told her about the God of Israel was evident in her obedience. After all, Baal worship was accomplishing nothing. None of her Sidonite gods were answering any of the prayers to, to help her and her family and keep them from perishing. Maybe, just maybe, the God of Israel, this God of Elijah, would help her and her family in their dying misery. And maybe, just maybe, God sent this, this prophet, Elijah, to this poor widow because he loved her so much and heard her cries in the middle of the night for her son. And God is like that. He's no respecter of positions. He's no respecter of powerful people versus little common people with no, nothing to offer. He loves every person the same. Elijah would help her and her family in their dying misery, and she would also be used to help him supply his needs. She was a provider of what God multiplied. You see the pattern in Scripture about all this? The miracle of the loaves and fishes and the reason why it was told twice? Because God takes the little things that little people offer with a heart of thanksgiving and multiplies it. <laughs> and we're fed. Elijah was fed. The woman and her child were fed. They were saved because of the word of the Lord and Elijah's obedience to the Lord. The, the jar of flour was not spent. Neither was the jug of oil uh, empty, according to the word spoken. The widow's food supply was supernaturally extended as promised. God hears the cries of his little people. Don't think I'm just a little person and God doesn't hear me. God hears the cries of his little people. And he responds to those cries and he cares for us. Don't think that God will leave you or forsake you or leave you hanging. He is not a God that leaves you hanging. He is a God that will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. He might not give you exactly what you want. He might not supply all of your wants. But he will supply every need. And he knows exactly what you need. And he will supply it every time. You can trust him at his word as a child of God. This is what the story is all about. And he will take you to, to people that don't know him whose hearts are searching and who are desperate in the times of troubles that we face in this world. And he will use you as a minister to them as they even might even minister to you as God directs. <laughs> that widow was on her last leg, preparing her last meal. But God showed her mercy and brought her and his servant into the same path. Don't be surprised when God brings you into paths with others that don't know him. And he might even use that person who doesn't even know him to supply your need. And you supply that person with what they need because they need not only physical sustenance, they need spiritual life. And you are an ambassador of Christ. And when you speak the word of God, it's like the Lord himself is appealing through you because you are a child of the master and his spirit lives inside of you. So what you speak, you are not your own. You're purchased with a price. When you speak the word of God, you speak as though Jehovah God is speaking through you because he is. 
When you speak the word of God in obedience to him, you're speaking the word of Jehovah to him, to that person out there. So don't be afraid. Oh, they're going to reject me. This doesn't make any sense. Don't be afraid. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And, 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 and understand that he is with you. Both the children of God and those who don't know and serve him are affected by the troubles of this world. Right? We see it. Who here is not affected by what's going on right now? All of us are. We're all affected by it. God wants us to be faithful in the midst of the trouble, sharing his words of warning and salvation with those who do not know him. Yes, this is a time for us to be able to talk to people and reason with them about what we believe and the hope that we have in Christ. Take that opportunity. Don't be afraid. God speaks through his little people. He speaks through you. And he's called you. Everything you're going through right now is to prepare you for this. God's, God took Elijah out of Ahab's presence and hit him for a season to prepare him for what he was going to do in the life of that widow in the land at that time. We can be thankful to the Lord. Everything that happens to us is for a reason. There's nothing that happens to you that's outside of God's sovereign plan. Yeah, sometimes we fail. Sometimes we mess it up. But God can even take the things that we mess up and turn them around so that we learn a lesson, so that we are taught something that will, in the end, bring glory to him. He can take everything that's happened to us and turn it around for his glory. Even when we're in the worst of droughts, we can thank the Lord for his provision, for his protection, and for his abiding presence within us. <laughs> Just like Elijah, God has given us, all of us, gifts. He's given us gifts. And he's called us to serve him with those gifts for his purpose in his kingdom. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Your gifts are not given to serve yourself. They're given to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. The big lesson in the story is he plants us where he wants us. God plants us where he wants us. He takes care of us, uses us for his kingdom purposes, and supplies all of our needs in the whole process wherever we are planted regardless of how desperate or impossible the circumstances may appear. Paul said to the church in Corinth, or in Philippi, in Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply, will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Further to this, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And finally, this Thanksgiving Sunday, brothers and sisters, in accordance with what is written in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Not some. All. All. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen? Amen.